Hello, hello, hello. How's everyone doing tonight? So I'm a little bit late here because I have been trying to sort out this audio issue with the intermittent stuttering. Um, I have no idea what's causing it. I've been trying to hunt it down for a bit now, um, but I have no idea. So, okay. Hello from Canada. Okay, so let's see here. How's everything working? Uh, looks like it's a bit laggy. Yeah, let me try one quick thing. Um, yeah, I don't know what's causing the issue. Um, I've dug through a bunch of settings. I, I can't figure out why I'm still having this issue. Um, but I'll dig into it later. I just attribute it to um, using a 12-year-old PC to stream. So we'll just uh, say it's that and move on with our lives. So, uh, where we left off, I believe, was the afterburner. going to be finishing up this guy. So last we had the hot end and the pocket watch assembled. Uh, could be trying to cancel mic feedback. Um, are you hearing the issue in the music or are you hearing the issue in just the voice? <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Um, it is on the list, but that's behind like new camera and everything because uh, I'm sure you guys are very much loving the 720p 1999 web camo vision here. Um, Let's see, where were we at on this build? Okay, so we need to attach this guy. So, on the pocket watch, yeah, it's only the voice, eh? Um, let me see here. I'm using voice meter. If somebody knows anything that I shouldn't be doing here. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what's going on with the cutout. So. Anyways. There we go. Turn up gains. Um, Kyle, gains is as loud as it goes in Windows. Um, actually, voice meter in Windows 10 with USB mics, you're limited in the amount of gain you can set up and with most USB mics, especially boom ones like this, um, you can't go higher. Because uh, right now, 
Let me switch it over. Yeah, I am using OBS. Let's see here. Okay, so right now this is just the mic by itself, not in OBS. Um, I don't know. I, I can't hear myself right now. So I don't know if uh, this sounds any better, but this is just the mic itself without using a voice meter. So I th think it's a bit quieter because I'm not seeing the gains as high. Um, let me pull up my own stream. It's cutting out the same, eh? Uh, okay, well, we're just going to have to live with it, and I'll have to look into it later. Unless it's an issue with OBS. Still dropouts, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, now we're back on uh, voice meter. Okay, so we're back on voice meter. Um, thank you, Dominico. Yeah, some I I don't know. Again, twelve year old computer. Um, so, anyways, let's get back to building. So, uh, Danny, I am using hardware encoding. That's the only reason this ten year old computer is actually holding up. Is it's got a GTX ten sixty in it. So, yeah, I know the issue is back, Kyle. Um, I think it is related to OBS because I didn't have this issue when I was just trying recording locally uh, for a voiceover for one of the instructional videos. It recorded fine. So I I'm thinking it's actually an issue with OBS itself. Um, I don't know. Like, if you want, I can go back to the using the C920 mic. So, where were we at? I think Bert's flying. Uh, voicemail virtual buffer here. Used to... So, how do I disable virtual buffer? <laughs> Welcome to the Saturday night tech support and printing build stream. How does this go together? Oh yeah, that goes like that. Okay. Uh, sample rate is too high. Uh, it's what the 44 kilohertz is that what I'm looking at or the 160 bit in OBS uh, let me see here we're gonna spend half this stream diagnosing technical issues uh, let's see audio it has voice meter yeah, audio bit rates 160 look at OBS sample rate it's 44.1 and my Windows input is 44.1 and uh, voice meter has 44.1 kilohertz uh, okay let me try dropping that down which I'm gonna have to pause stream for a second Okay, 128 kilobits. Uh, see if that helps at all. Um, hopefully it does. I would like this to work. Um, yeah. Nope, still doing it? Crap. <sighs> this is annoying. Yeah, still dropping. Uh, let me see here.
Yeah, I have no idea. Okay, um, well, I'll keep going, I guess. Um, see how this works. Um, yeah, okay, I think it's okay-ish. Okay, well, we'll keep on going. So, uh, don't look at my private stuff, which I don't have anything on this computer because I don't even have Discord on this computer. So, we are going to continue the build. I'm not dropping any frames, uh, hamster, at least on my end. Um, this is really annoying, isn't it? Uh, everything seems smooth. Uh, I don't know. We'll just trudge on. Okay. Back to printer building. Okay, so we are going to build the afterburner. So we already have the pocket watch assembled and we already have the, uh, the quick change portion of the hot end assembled. So we're gonna build this uh, frame portion here. So uh, what part is that? The fan assemblies, don't need that, don't need that, don't need that, don't need that. And high clockwork. There we go. Okay. So let's see here put this guy together. So we're gonna have four screws that bolt to the carriage. And I believe, yes, we do have one, two, three bolts that go through the whole assembly that hold it together. And they're probably 40 mils. So, Another 30 mils, let's see. Yep, these are 30 mils. Yeah, the audio issue is really annoying because I, I did spend some time this week trying to sort it out and I, I got rid of it. I think, I thought I did, but now it's back. So this is a, uh, a USB microphone. Um, I do have an add-in USB uh, PCI Express card coming in. So I'm hoping USB 3.0 might fix this issue. I don't know, but that's coming in for another reason. Um, hopefully next week it should be solved by then. Um, it is what it is. Now, when you're assembling, you may notice that for these two locations where you have the hex nuts, um, they're very hexagonal, the holes. But this one down here is very circular, the hole. Um, that's because the magnet for your Hall Effect end stop, if you are using the Hall Effect end stop, does install in here too. So don't be worried if your hex isn't quite hex for this hole. two halves together.
Okay. So that is that portion. And we do have our two heat sets already installed. Um, these ones you really want to make sure they are flush and not sticking up uh, past the surface because you're going to have part mount directly over it. So the heat sets are installed. So we have our little lock here. That this is for attaching our PL08. So this is going to need some heat sets. Yeah, uh, pure. At this point, I'm just going to rack everything up to um, ten year old Xeon and roll with that. Once uh, prices sort of stabilize, I I'm tempted to uh, do like a 3300X Ryzen build or just something uh, cheap. So I can put this computer, which used to be my computer for uh, YouTube and Netflix back in the living room. And yes, this camera will be the first thing getting replaced. It's bloody atrocious. Again, heat set insert. You only need it hot enough to set whatever you're setting. So in this case, 220. If you go too hot, you'll melt the plastic and actually burn it. And you won't have as strong of a, of a set for your insert. Yeah, my uh, main desktop upstairs um, is a 3700X build. Um, for streaming, in this case, I... If I'm doing okay with a X5450, I, I really don't need a 3900. So, yeah, Jeff, I, I put a thing out uh, saying I was going live about two hours ago, but yeah, YouTube notifications suck. Okay. So we got our PL08. Um, this one, because I was being fancy, is wrapped in some uh, gold reflective tape. Um, Try and keep the heat out. I've had this one for a while. This one uh, was going to be in tall boy. I'm just reusing it. That's why it's cut and crimped already. So this guy's going to fit in here. There we go. And we're going to need some screws. So let's see here. Twenty mil. Uh, does the gold tape help or is it bling? Um, both. Um, it does help a little bit apparently with uh, reflecting the heat. So it keeps the probe from being a little melty, but I've been using the exact same probe in uh, 26 here, and uh, it's running right now. And uh, that probe is probably a year and a half, two years old, and it's out in the open. And uh, the sticker on it's a little burnt, but other than that, it, the probe functions fine still. Um, I bet it's USB. Anything else on the bus that seals all the bandwidth intermittently? Um, right now, all the webcams, and everything is plugged into the same like four ports on this old motherboard. That's why I have a, a PCI Express expansion USB card on the way. So I'm hoping that uh, kind of helps. What iron is that? Um, that iron that I am using uh, for heat set is a crappy $10 or $15 Amazon special. Um, when I'm actually soldering, um, I use a TS-100. I love my TS-100. Uh, 
what are the more accurate people using, PL05 or PL08? So the 05 and the 08, um, basically it's like a tick. Um, they're only accurate to like, uh, how do I explain this? The 05 and the 08, it, it's sensor distance, but they only have the same, I don't know, what is it? The 05 is more accurate, but it has less range because their resolution is the same. It's just on the 08, it's stretched over eight millimeters. On the 05, it's over five millimeters. The problem is off of bare aluminum. Um, so if you're running just your, your bed with PEI on it, no flex plate, you need the 08 because aluminum doesn't sense as easily as steel. Uh, if you're running a steel flex plate, you can get by with the 05 and it will be more accurate. Um, but this guy's running an 08 on a flex plate because I'm lazy and I haven't swapped it and I, I've had zero issues. So it's, it's kind of like a personal preference thing. Um, okay. Now I haven't screwed down the probe tight yet. Uh, because you will have to adjust this. You want to make sure that your nozzle uh, sticks out past the probe. You do not want your probe uh, sticking out past your nozzle. Otherwise, you're gonna have a bad time. So let's put that there for now. before you put the screw in. And I don't think it matters which direction. Now in the original revision, um, so if you did the beta afterburner for 2.2, I believe it doesn't have this point, pivot point, but this is just an ever so slight pivot point that allows if there is any slight misalignment in your two character carriages, um, this allows it to just kind of pivot ever so slightly so you're not binding. So when you install your carriages, um, the front facing carriage, or when you're installing your rails, and I'll cover this when I get the frame back up, the, the rail that you're looking straight at, you wanna have that one installed with your guide blocks and squared, and then the bottom one you want loose, and that one's the one you will adjust to your fixed one once you have this installed. Uh, the gold tape. Um, I got it when I got the probe. Um, I bought it from somebody else. I think Doc was selling them a while ago because these are, I think, like eBay Fotex. So they're actually Fotec probes, not trying to knock off Fotec. Um, and he had a bunch of the stuff and he was giving it out with it. But this was, you know, a year and a half ago. Okay. So we have the probe in. We have that. We got all that. Um, don't put your magnets in until you put your hall effect together. I'll point that out why when we get to it. Okay, so now we can put the pocket watch on. Or clockwork. So that is clockwork. So, to screw it together. on like how does this go that would help if I had it the right way around there we go there we go so it does index let's see here Together. and there is a slot here for your cables hopefully I don't have to uh, finagle these ones and recrimp them and we screw it together now let's just eyeball some screws let's try 20 mil yeah 20 mil works And this 
one is longer. So that one goes, the screw goes all the way through. So I think it's a 40 mil. Which... M330, M340. Shiny time. Fortunately, with uh, Rona season being a thing, I don't have access to my uh, Fastenal hookup. Actually, no, that is a 20 mil because that one actually goes to there. Never mind, we are good. Okay, so they are about 20 mil in the back here. Did I forget to put a heat set in there? One second. Isn't it fun building things without a manual? <laughs> Silver screws aren't blasphemy. Um, so let's see, did I need to put a heat set in there? Guess who forgot to put a heat set in a part? This guy! Okay. Welcome to On the Bus, Off the Bus, where we put stuff together and then we take it apart because we forgot something. Yeah, you should watch the video first um, before building because if you follow along, you'll be putting stuff together and taking it apart like I do. Ask anyone who has a, uh, a sub, what is it about, a sub uh, 13 or 14 V0 serial number, how, how many times they had to take their thing apart and put it back together. Yeah, there we go. So I forgot this heat set insert. So now we gotta wait for the iron to heat up again. Yeah, cool, dude. Uh, if you have the CAD, you should have no problem building this printer, especially if you've built another Voron or any other 3D printer before. Um, 2.4 is a very simplified compared to 2.2. Um, it's just you gotta pay attention for heat sets because that's a new thing now is the heat sets. this together. Don't forget that nut. Okay, so I'm going to put this all back together now.
Welcome, Alberto. Yeah, having, having a CAD file makes it so much easier when you're building these, simply for visualization. There we go. Everything works. Got access to everything, everything lines up. Okay, so back to where we were. There, that goes there. 20 mils. Uh, there are a couple heat set inserts in V2, if I remember correctly. Not, not many, not as many as here, uh, but there are some. I think this is a longer one. This might be a 30 mil. together the Y and it's grindy on both ends um, Alberto so are you talking about both extrusions like when you're moving them back and forth it's grindy or individually like without the uh, X gantry attached I, I okay Greg I this the technique where I spin this I've I don't know I've that's a common thing in the trade, I guess. I don't know. It just doesn't seem that weird to me. Every time I do it, though, people are blown away, and I'm like, it's, it's kind of normal. Okay, so at this point, we need to install. Let's see here. These guys. So what these two screws are for is they... Uh, Allow your, where is it, tool head cartridge. These are basically like the locators. They're like locating pins for your uh, the heater cartridge assembly here, or the tool head cartridge. Um, so we need to put these screws in. Now these are just sitting in uh, plastic. They're not, uh, they just need to be there. So because you want to screw these in just enough that they sit at the correct position. So, inspect. So 16 millimeters long. So on the ends, uh, 
Yeah, you, you want to basically... Um, we're going to have to take this off again because I can't fit the screws in. <laughs> One day I will get this afterburner built. So take your screws off. So you're going to be putting these on, these locating screws on, before you attach the clockwork. Man, tonight is on the bus, off the bus night for sure. Okay. So the 16 mils for locating go in. And these are just tapping, self-tapping into plastic basically. These are 20, what are these 16 mil? is actually really simple it's just there's like an order of operations to it so. yeah that, that gold foil is definitely not needed that is that is just some Gucci um, stuff you, you you do not need to put cold foil on your probe especially if you go with one of the better ones if you if you have the two dollar one it might you know give it an extra bit of life but i i wouldn't you know be ripping my tool head apart to put it in right now so what you're going to do is just sort of screw them down so that they're tight but you want to be able to remove the tool head cartridges. There we go. So these are basically your locators for the upper portion. The bottom portion gets screwed in. So on the 2.2, how your indexing poles were on the bottom, now they're on the top and they're screws. So it's a little bit more of a robust mounting system. Okay. Now we put the pocket watch, or the, uh, the clockwork back on for the millionth time. Am I doing a Galileo eventually? I, I may. I'm having no issues with the uh, afterburners and clockwork. Um, I, I may do the Galileo, um, but I, I'm gonna wait until that's like a fully developed product basically before I jump into that. Um, as of right now, these clockworks functionally functioning just fine for me. Um, and I'm trying to get both machines up and running stable. Um, like this guy's running, but I'm trying to get back into uh, fifth production. So I, I'm trying to basically make both the machines using, you know, known good parts. Not, I'm not saying the Galileo is not good. I'm just trying to avoid uh, test parts, at least for now. Uh, isn't the groove mount on the Dragon removable with two screws from the inside? Yes, uh, with the Dragon. Um, you have a groove mount on it. There are two screws on the bottom. You remove it, and then we use uh, screws to mount it. We do not use the groove mount for mounting the dragon on any of the Vorons because groove mount needs to die. That is why. Okay. And yes, dragon is single-handed nozzle change. And the reason you get away with that is when you look at it, your heat break is actually uh, not being used to hold the heater block on. You actually have rigid mounting points for mounting your heater block to the heat sink. So this doesn't move versus the 
the E3D way of it, where your heat break, which you want to be as thin as possible to avoid thermal transference, also has to be thick because it's the only thing holding your heater block in position. And if your nozzle comes loose, the whole shebang comes loose and things fall apart and ooze. So they're using something that should be very thin and weak as something structural. And then they made the super volcano, which you have all that extra mass and heater um, that can easily start a fire if it starts flying around, um, hanging off a very thin heat break. And that's the only thing holding it in. I do not like the V6. It is, it should be retired. So that's my little E3D rant of the night. I don't know why they, they kept that heat, bro uh, heat block design with the Hemera instead of going to a rigid mount. Wait, because the Hemera is not that good. Um, this guy is using a Mosquito uh, simply for the fact that I already have Two of them. I have one in here, and then the other guy in uh, 26, and then the dragon's actually going in the V0. So I will uh, be swapping out the tool head on that eventually. Uh, uh, threaded V6 is pretty much. Oh uh, well, groove mount is groove mount's not the only problem with V6. Um, threaded V6 is actually what we use for the V6 option for the V0 because there's no room for a groove mount. Where'd my music go? There we go. Okay. Yeah, it, it the way they have it set up, I, I do not like the way they have it set up. It, it's, it should be a lot stronger than it is. It's, it's old tech in my opinion. Okay. So now we have basically uh, this assembled. So we've removed the tool head because we don't need it right now. And we're gonna wait to install that to pretty much the end. So we are going to build the fans. So fan assembly. So this part is relatively simple. He said before proceeding to have to take it apart 20 times. Yeah, the Hemera, the thing I don't like about it is it uses the same style of mounting as the V6 with the, uh, your heat break is also structural. I don't like that. And then the, uh, the motor, your motor generates heat and you're attaching that to the thing that's supposed to try and get rid of heat. And then it's also fat. It's very wide like this. Everything's vertical on this. But the Hemera, it's, it's, it's lengthwise. I'd rather have it vertical and just, you know, spend an extra five bucks for some extrusions that are a little bit longer instead of losing XY space on my printer. But that's just me. Yeah, pretty much just get a Dragon, slap a, an afterburner on it, or just get a, a BMG if you are putting on another printer. So we have to decase this fan first. So I'm going to find my little screwdriver. So when you're taking apart your uh, 4020 blower here, you want to be careful not to uh, damage anything. So there's little tabs around the outside. You want to uh, pop those when you take this apart. Because I've already broken one of these. There we go. Have I used Jetpack? Um, one second here. I've used Jetpack standalone. I actually was the guy who did the uh, the CAD work to make the standalone version of the Jetpack. Um, so I, I actually ran it on my uh, on 26 for a while before I swapped it up to Afterburner. So I, I have run jetpack but not the uh mounted to the extrusion or mounted to the uh, x extrusion version of the jetpack 
Um, Dominico, um, I will be probably stream the uh, tool head swap on the B0 because uh, I got to redo some wiring on that. So I might be going over the wiring as well. Um, just kind of showing it off if anyone has any questions. So I'll, I probably will be doing that in the future, but I'm the priority is getting this guy up. So uh, we need to install the blower. So we take the front part off. And we put it in here. Now for the wires, um, I believe we have them come out the back. Let's see here. Yeah, because we have a cutout in the back, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a, uh, a little notch here for where your wires come out. So you will have this little tab here holding your wires in. You're going to want to slide your wires underneath this tab. So they're not coming out the side anymore, they're coming out the back. And these wires now are just soldered onto here. So you want to be careful not to uh, damage them or pull too hard and break them. Because if you break the solder joint, you, you probably could fix it with some finagling, but it uh, would be not fun. So just don't break it. There we go. So, go. Jetpack interested in seeing the V0 tool head. My X axis bottoms out on the one AB drive before the others, leaving a two to three millimeter gap. Um, are you talking about uh, Robert when you're moving it towards the back? It bottoms out one side before the other, or you mean when you're coming down Z wise? Uh, Bodan, there is no uh, hardware kit for V2.4 yet. Um, somebody would have to make one. Um, so right now everything is pretty much self-sourced. Okay, so um, we just take our front plate here and we uh, put that on. And then we have some screws that hold it together. So we have two screws from the back here. And these ones are just a uh, friction fit, or um, they just thread right into the plastic. And then I'm just making sure I have clearance everywhere. Because I know we've changed uh, this a few times for clearance for different uh, parts, because we've had issues with clearance in the past, and I think I might have an old revision here. I think I'm good. Maybe not. Let's see here. So that goes there. That covers that. Yeah, so I fit together fine. Okay. Yeah, I think we're good. Uh, Robert, when moving backwards. Um, so what you're describing there, Robert, is what's called racking. And what that happens is, is basically your gantry isn't lined up, um, perpendic no, perpendicular to your y-axis. So your y-axis and your x-axis, instead of being perpendicular to each other, they're, uh, the one where they're on an angle. Math. Um, so I actually covered that when I put my gantry on last week's video. Um, however, hopefully if I get, you know, the belts in Tallboy tonight, which I'm hoping, um, I'll make a video specifically on how to fix racking, because that's a very common issue you'll see with Core XY printers, is racking. So that is, that is exactly what the issue is there. You have a, a rack issue. And I'm assuming when you go towards the front, you'll have the opposite, where the corner that was staying away from the back AB mount is now hitting the front idler first. Okay, so put this back in. Okay. 
Okay, so we're gonna need some screws here. So because they're screwing into plastic, I wanna make sure I'm using the right length. Because if you use screws that are too long when you screw into plastic, um, you can basically destroy the threads. So always make sure you're using the right screws here. And in this case, I need 16 mil. So, so 16 mil. And once you uh, finish screwing these in, you'll, you'll know. You really don't want to rip the threads out. Uh, Kyle Davis, lock tabs in the way. Oh, you know what? I might have the revision of that with the uh, lock tabs. Let me take a look here. Take a look here. Yep, the joys of building stuff with uh, pre-production parts. Yep, Robert, so in that case, you do have a rack gantry. Um, I, I did cover it when I put the gantry on my previous uh, stream last week. Um, yep, it is the lock tabs. Okay, so we are going to do a little bit of surgery here. Uh, these guys are like 99 cents on AliExpress. Get like 20 pairs of them. Because they're, uh, they will break eventually and get dull quick because China Steel. But until then, they're really sharp and real handy. Oh, there we go. Much better. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. So yeah, that, that was the issue. I knew about that, but I forgot about that. Okay, so that is your blower housing. Now, if you look at it and you notice that the uh, the hole here isn't concentric, it kind of goes on an angle. Don't worry, your print didn't shift or anything. It's supposed to be like that, um, aerodynamics and whatnot. So we have that portion. And now we have the bottom part. There we go. Oh, it's upside down. There we go. Okay, and the bottom part is literally... Um, this. So um, you take your fan and you push it in and you're done. So I think on this one we got to do the same thing where we got to take the uh, yeah. Yeah. So you're going to want to take it out of the uh, little retaining tap here as well. Break the wires because this is a tight fit. You could cut it, but I, I don't like breaking stuff just in case I ever need to use it again for another reason. Okay. And then your wire will come up through this channel right here. So this allows it to pivot. You're good there. So to hold uh, this together, Gonna need some filament. Yeah, Jeff, job. Let me find him. If you want, if you want Gucci, um, I've got these guys. Um, they're beat up. Like they're they're beat up but these will cut through quite a bit. Um, 
Gate Pro PTF 70s. These are meant for cutting runners off uh, molds that just came out of injection presses pretty much. Um, I snagged a pair a while ago because they were pretty much all worn out, but they're still obscenely sharp. And they're uh, they're very nice because you got, they actually have like a set screw on them, so you can make it so once they close, you can't actually squeeze them any tighter, and it protects the edge. It prevents you from crushing it. So this is, comes the part where you find out how good your print tolerances are, because you're going to try and feed filament through here, through here, and back through. So let's get the portion here that's kind of straight. Lead on. Now, depending on you know how good your print settings are, you may have to uh, run a two millimeter drill bit through these holes to make sure everything's good and lined up. But I think I'm okay here. Yeah, everything goes through, I just gotta line it up. So when you print, if you happen to uh, smush your first layer a little flat, you might have to trim this just a little bit because these should pivot up and clear. wires they both come through and they go out there and now this screws on to here so make sure nothing's pinched line it up so we're not pinching any wires because you really don't want to pinch wires screw it all together. Which I think 30 mils. Uh, Dark Nitro, is there a multi-filament uh, feature in the works? Um, at this point there is no official multi-material solutions in the works. Um, there are a few people working on a few ideas. Um, Odds are, if you're going to see multi-material, it's probably going to be on the V1.8, not the V2, uh, simply for the fact that the V1.8 has a, uh, a design that's more standard. Um, it's got a fixed gantry versus the moving gantry on the V2. It would make like tool, it would make tool swaps easier. Um, um, with the V2, because you're moving the gantry, you have issues with uh, position of where you're going to put tool changes at, we're going to store extra tool heads, um, extra wires, extra Bowden having to all move versus a V1 where it's all fixed at the top. So there are, you know, a few people playing around with using uh, the TLY splitter. Um, some people are kind of playing with the idea of swappable tool heads, um, but there's nothing official. It's just kind of playing around with ideas. So uh, right now, if you want to do multi-material, there are a couple ways. Um, you can use a, a Y splitter and just simply slap that on top and use that. Um, but then you have the issue of retractions. You can use something like the pallet, 
Um, that does work. Um, some people have been running on. Doc's been running one on his V2. Um, the issue with the pallet is you um, you kind of slow down your Voron because the Voron prints faster than the pallet can actually uh, splice and build up the buffer of filament. So you will have to drop your print speeds if you are printing with a pallet. Um, technically, you could also use like an MMU because uh, um, it would work the same way as the pallet. So th there are a few ways to currently do multi-material, but there is no official way yet because officially there is no real way that we uh, like, that we think is up to our standard essentially. Okay, so we have that. Now I could install the uh, heater assembly at this point. Let's see, that goes there, that goes there. But I am not going to uh, because when we go to belt everything together, uh, this guy can't be in because we got to tension the belts and screw them into the back there. So right now I'm just kind of making sure everything lines up. Which I do have actually a little bit of clearance issue on the top here. So let's see. things here. Okay, so that can come out. Oh, that's why. Okay. one uses 40 mils. So I am going to have to use my 30 or my silver 40 mils here. But yeah, the MMU would be the only real uh, solution um, or some sort of strap add-on um, other than the Y splitter. So at this time there is really no solution we like. putting this together right now for fitment, but I am going to have to take it back apart. Yeah, filament splicer, Alberto, that's pretty much what the pallet is. Okay, so hopefully I don't drop it. But that is the assembled afterburner right there. So, oh no, I scuffed it. There we go. Okay, so that is the assembled afterburner. So now we're going to have to put this in the printer. So, give me a minute here to make some room. Replacing the hot end fan wire to silicone would be better. Um, I have seen people cut it and swap it to silicone. Uh, these ones from Fisec already have the uh, Microfit 3 connector already attached. It's not in the greatest location, but I'm going to give it a shot and leave it as it is. But it, it is silicone after the connector because you're going to have connectors on everything on the hot end. Um, 
right here and then it's it, I have all the silicone going all the way back to where the uh, controller would be. So let's get tall boy. Dark Nitro, this is random, but how do you feel about using water cooling instead of fans? Um, water, hoses moving at 300 millimeters a second, high voltage power supply, high voltage bed. Not a fan. Um, if I if I was making a printer that was you know printing peak continuously in a super enclosed, um, specially designed enclosure, um, maybe and it was fully designed uh the problem is it, i don't i don't foresee ever running water on one of these maybe a v1.8 something with a fixed gantry but with the moving gantry having water hoses fly all over the place now it, it's been done um people have done it there are there is hardware out there to do it um but i i personally don't see any real massive reason to do that unless you are printing peak which at 400 dollars a kilogram um is kind of out of the um the realm of the home gamer. So, Alberto, uh, Nero, can you move your gantry around? I want to see how it should feel. Like that. Belts are loose still because I last week I just kind of tightened them by hand just quickly. Let them sit under gravity before I final tension them. I'll do that at the very end. Um, so yeah. Okay, so now we need to uh, mount this guy. So first thing we're gonna do is what I've been doing all night and take it back apart. So what you have to do is pretty much take out the, uh, where your hot end is mounted. So that unit has to come out because you need access to the holes behind it for mounting the, uh, to the carriage. And then what I'm actually gonna do is take off the fans as well, just so I have more room to play around with. If I push on one side, does it mess up? But I deracked it. Um, everything moved independently by itself with zero issues. Um, and then I also went through and uh, I deracked the gantry. So everything is pretty much perfectly in place on this guy. So I, I, I will do a video on how to fix racking issues because that is a common issue, especially with any Core XY printer, it's a common issue. So take that off. Take our fans off. It's probably just racked. Okay, so um, now you, you can run the afterburner with one extrusion or one uh, rail. We do recommend using two. It's designed for two for extra stability. If you do use it for one, the only reason, reason I would say do that is if you're waiting on a rail to come in and you're doing a 2.2 to 2.4 upgrade. Um, if you're building from scratch, definitely go with two rails. Um, the extra rigidity is very, is good. <laughs> so you are gonna want that. So let's see what size screws we need because we always wanna make sure we're using the right screws. There we go. 
for these ones, you really want to make sure you're using the right screws because they'll bottom out. So eight mil. Which I am running low on, so I'm just going to use silver ones. That's the ones I was low on. Alberto, uh, it's not lo-fi. Um, I normally do listen to lo-fi hip-hop. Uh, the problem is I was getting copyright strikes like mad from it. So I'm actually listening to uh, Stream Beats, it's called. It's specifically music that you shouldn't get copyrighted with, hopefully. Uh, Patrick asking, do I use corner cubes? Yes, I am using Basumi corner cubes in this frame. You don't need corner cubes. Um, I like them personally because it makes squaring up your frame easier. Um, but it, it's not required, and they add about forty dollars to your price. I can't really get you a good uh, camera angle right now, but I am putting screws in. You've seen that a million times. And actually, if I remember correctly, uh, let me check one thing. Now we should be good. Yeah, we, we changed the design. Um, originally, you had to use button heads, I believe. Um, so you had clearance, but we redesigned the, uh, the clamps. You no longer need them, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, as you can see here, these tie-down clamps have little notches, so you can use socket heads here. I think originally we had to use button heads. Uh, Dark Nitro. Uh, this guy is a uh, tall boy for a reason. It's 330 by 330 by 410, 420. So, it's a tall boy. Do I have tips for squaring the frame without uh, corner cubes? Yes. Um, if you have a granite countertop, use that to build your frame on. If you have an oven with a glass top, use that to build your frame on. Those are usually the flattest things in your house. Um, if you have neither, build it on the flattest thing you can find. Concrete, slab, in your garage, wherever you think is flat. And uh, use a tape measure. With a tape measure, you build, this, build your frame. And then measure corner to corner. And if the number is the same, that side is square. So you would actually measure from that corner to that corner, and then from this corner to that corner, and they should be the exact same. Now, if they're within, you know, a millimeter, over 500 millimeters, you'll probably be fine. It's a 3D printer, but uh, that will help you get it as square as you can get without, you know, building it on a granite layout table. Yeah, the uh, 26 back here, this is a 250. So, so this part's gonna be fun. So one of the reasons not to build big is a uh, room. You don't realize how little desk space you have until you uh, fill it with a printer. putting in the uh, four screws, again M38, and this holds the other carriage into position. Now again, when I built this last week, this front carriage right here is squared up using the uh, squaring blocks, the printed squaring blocks. This bottom one is just finger tight. So this rail actually isn't secured yet. It does have a little bit of wibble 
wiggle wobble to it, we're going to tighten that up using our carriage as the guide because we don't want this to bind on us. So you want to make sure they're square to each other. Or correction, you, you want one square and the other one square to the first rail, not square to itself. Because you don't want to you don't want them binding. So okay, close that. What I like to do is when I do this, have it upwards because this is how the printer runs. So you want it in its running position and just kind of see how everything feels. Now obviously you are going to have a bit of play. So make sure everything on that bottom one is loose so it can find its home. Yeah, so we are, we're not going to add the, the bubble yeah, would work. We don't need Rick Sanchez levels of precision here. If, if some other, you know, groups want to spend obscene amounts of money chasing down super level, go ahead. But we, you don't really need it. So what I do now, um, I run it back and forth a bunch just to kind of let it find its home. And then I'll, I'll tighten one end just a little bit, run it to the other end. Just a little bit. Check it. Tighten one in the middle. Just a little bit. There we go. Make sure we're not having to bind. You might have to loosen that bottom uh, pivot block that screws to the extrusion or screws to the rail on the bottom, just in case that uh, is causing some misalignment. And then this is something you kind of have to go by feel. You, you'll know when it feels good. And then once you get everything in, snug everything up again. Try it again. And then if you're happy with it, then go through and actually tighten everything down. Okay, yeah, I'm finding it funny that these folks want to make 500 millimeter square, 600 millimeter uh, cubes, sorry. Uh, printers, hope they plan to never move it. Yep, um, I'm pretty sure somebody has built a V2 that is, um, it's kind of like that um, steam engine in that kid's book that dug a hole for a building or a foundation for a house or whatever, and it couldn't get out of the hole and it uh, now lives in the basement. So I can definitely see that happen, happening with some of these bigger builds, and I firmly believe people have done it. Oh, I got a strip screw there. Place that one. So now I'm just going through and make sure everything is tight. Now, one thing, um, just thinking of it now, because of the number of issues that this has caused over the years, um, your X extrusion, you're gonna wanna check and make sure that thing is not bent before you start building your printer. If you have a bent X extrusion, um, you're gonna be chasing gremlins for a long time. So take your X extrusion, put it on the flattest thing in your house, and just flip it around and uh, see how it feels. You really want to make sure that that thing is good and not uh, 
bent. Because if it is bent, you're going to be chasing gremlins and it's going to be annoying. There we go. There we go. Okay. So, we have our carriage installed. Yeah, the V0 uh, Dark Nitro is, is a perfect like backup printer because um, it, it's small. It doesn't take up a lot of room. If your big guy goes down, any functional part required to build a Voron, uh, any of the Vorons can be printed on the V0. The largest individual part, I believe, is for the AB motor mounts. Um, yeah, it would be the AB motor mounts and they fit on the bed. So it's a perfect backup printer. Or if you need to just print something small and you don't want to heat up a 500 watt bed um, and seven motors, you just you know want to print a little thing, saves power, saves money. Uh, and it's also good for, you know, this is a 27 hour plate of parts I'm running right now. If I needed to print something off, I'd have to wait for that to finish or I could just quickly print it on the V0. So I'm pretty sure you can run it off a of battery if you're printing PLA and you don't need the uh, bed so yeah, I'm pretty sure somebody was planning to make a backpack version for uh, Midwest Rep Rap Fest before uh, Rona kiboshed all that. Yeah, flipping the big printers can be annoying. That's why you put the bed in last. Don't install the bed until everything's done, even the wiring. That's my opinion. Okay, so now we're going to do some belting. music again yes I am still here YouTube play music okay so these are the belts from 2.2 or 2. Point, yeah my two when this was a 2.2 so I'm just reusing them gates now where did I put So for any of you who are building a V0, um, you have to have, have these little printed blocks with heat set inserts and these hold your belts into place. And these work per perfectly fine. I've been using the printed ones up till now. Um, however, if you are making a V0 and you bought the uh, Maker Beam T-nuts that you need specifically for the V0, um, these make a very good substitute for those printed uh, parts. So I'm actually going to be using these guys because one, they're metal. They should last a little bit longer, but it's, it shouldn't be an issue. I'm not saying it's going to be an issue. I'm just saying it shouldn't be an issue. Um, and two, I forgot to print those printed parts. So instead of printing them, I'm going to use these. So that's why. They are not in my box of printed parts that I checked before I started streaming. So. so we need okay 20 mils way too long here probably 16 then so this is going to be kind of crappy and i apologize but i don't really have uh, a good camera angle for putting on the belts unfortunately. Um, it's just kind of awkward. I, I'm, you know what? I'm, eh, if I flip it on its side, everything's going to move. You, you, belting your X and Y, you do want it in this position so that your carriage doesn't go flying everywhere. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, just ask as I'm belting this up. Um, I'm going to try. I'll, I'll probably end up taking it apart um, after the stream this week sometime. So I can do a video specifically on uh, belting it up and how to fix racking. So, uh, Kit, I've seen some speculation on off-spec V zeros, basically just larger ones. By the time I can build one, I'm sure most of that will be figured out. Basically, on a V zero, um, if you are going to go bigger, I would not go bigger than 170. Um, the reason for that is 170 is increasing your rails and your extrusion by 50 millimeters. So that's a stock nominal size. 
you're not having to get a custom um, custom size essentially so you might save a little bit of money but it, you know, if they're willing to cut larger probably won't hurt but anything over about 180 190 so say 200 millimeters at most I would not be going with a v0 anymore that is uh, in my opinion firmly in the realm of the uh, that's v1 territory are too long so we'll do 16 or 12 mil and the only reason I wouldn't go that big uh, bigger than 200 on a V0 is it's a cantilever bed it's uh, It's, it's just not designed to go that big. It's 1515 extrusion. Um, the front, it doesn't have a front top crossbar, which at its size isn't an issue, but once you start going bigger, it might be an issue. So it's kind of the, uh, we just don't recommend it because we, we don't know and we don't want you to, you know, waste your money building it only to find out it doesn't really work too well. Okay. So I'm just sort of pre-installing my nuts right now. Uh, just to make it a little bit easier down the line. Okay. Now this part's kind of annoying. You, I've always done this on the floor because then you can just walk around the printer instead of having to spin the printer while you're belting it up. Um, but I'm doing it on camera, so I can't really do that. Feed the belt in, and then it comes out. So your belt, when you're looking at it, you're going to have the teeth. No, this, you can't see. You're going to have the teeth facing towards the front when you feed them into the uh, X carriage. So what I do is I just put one in, a little bit of extra. feed them both at, or only run one at a time but I get them both started and I clamp them down so that they're not uh, pulling out on me and it can be a little bit of a pain um, to get them in and then come straight out the front they like to catch on stuff Little bit of extra again don't cut them flush take them down a bit just so they don't go wandering okay there we go so we'll do the bottom one first watch me flip a printer 20 times in five minutes off because I'm just gonna get tangled in everything. I'm gonna have to get a soapbox to stand on. Now for the belting, um, the belt path is in the CAD. So if you um, are you know wondering how the belts are run, you can pull up the CAD and uh, follow the belt path in the CAD. It is there, so you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, fly by night. How does this go type thing? Go. Spin this. Drop the 
tweezers on my foot. And then having like a pair of like uh, tweezers or uh, a small skinny drew screwdriver um, to help feed the filament through, or the filament, the belt through um, the tighter areas does come in quite handy. bigger desk. There we go. You got this camera. This is honestly the most annoying part is getting it in the uh, come through here. Take a second here to go through the chat once I get this one built in. There we go. Okay. So, one belt in. everything up and make sure you know all your uh, everything's riding on all the idlers perfectly right now get both your belts in first and then come back to that so we got the one belt in
Okay, let's see here. Uh, what are the chances of one of these firing up and printing first try after assembly? Um, as long as you have your core XY mechanics correct and you know your motor assignments, you know, you make sure, you know, when you tell it to move left, it moves left, right, right, you know, you make sure your movements are right with core XY. If you have a motor backwards or your motors themselves are backwards, you, you don't get correct motion. Um, as long as you're, you, you have your bed um, situated correctly, you have your motor locations correct for the gantry tramming uh, routine. Um, basically, as long as it can auto tram the gantry, and your Z offset is correct, um, and your extruder isn't you know way out when it comes to E steps, um, it, it should print fine right off the bat. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think I have it. Um, oh, I do. Like this little fox right here was legit the very first thing I printed on my 2.2. I think it was 2.2 or 2.4. One, Yeah, it was 2.2. This legit was the very first thing I printed on a 2.2. So it was I had a functional 2.1. I completely ripped it apart. I built it up as a 2.2. So the only thing that I did was mechanicals. Um, the, the software and everything, I had to flip my motors around um, in the firmware and readjust my Z offset. Um, but other than that, this was the very first print off that printer. So yeah, uh, as long as your you know your your speeds and feeds are correct, it'll print fine out of the box. And there's a bunch of profiles already made up for the common slicers that should get you ninety percent of the way to having perfectly tuned prints. So yeah, so fully expect the printer to print good right out of the box. Well, off the desk, since you can't buy one of these in a box. And they're quiet. Like, this guy's been running constantly. I don't know if you can even hear it. part right here is the only real annoying part I find on the uh, the belt run is running it through your front idlers there's really not as much room as there used to be so you kind of have to kind of jam it in the hole a million times and hope it goes the right way one of them Can I? it probably is some trick that I don't realize I'm doing wrong but uh, eventually it goes in Nitro. It depends how fast. The, the reason you go with the Core XY is speed. Um, I don't know how fast you can really push a laser cutter. Um, plus, I don't know if laser cutters um, like Smoothieware and the, or any of the other firmwares that support laser cutters have Core XY mechanics built in. They might not accept. They might only be like Cartesian only. 
I'm not too sure. I haven't really looked into laser cutters. Yeah, Core XY, you need to make sure everything's aligned. If, if it's not aligned, you're going to have a bad time. Lots of eggs. There's a few people who can ask about eggs in the Voron Discord, if you're curious. Okay, come on. Get in your hole. There we go. Okay, did I break the belt? No, I did not. We're good. this one through the motor and you'll know why when you go putting these together but you'll understand why so many people put this together and have uh, this belt go around a plastic part that isn't an idler because it's it's a rigid plastic part so it's one of those you'll see what I mean when you go to do it how'd you get the extrusion get out of the extrusion Frame size is this. This is tall boy. This is um, print area is 330 by 330 by 410, 420. Um, it is 490 by 490 by 590 millimeters tall. Frame itself. Um, that is because when it was built, it was a uh, 300 by 300 by 400 V 1.5 because it was the first printer I ever built. And I went big because everyone goes big the first time they build a printer before realizing that's not a great idea. So. Instead of cutting the frame down, I'm just building it as is. And if it causes issues with the height, um, I'm fully prepared to chop it down if need be. So at this point, I'm hoping I don't need to. Um, but if I need to, I will. Because I, I really doubt. I'll probably print one thing using up the, pull, the full build volume just to do it once. And then after that, I'll probably never print anything this big ever again. Um, I know Smoothie supports Core XY. Does Smoothie support lasers? That's the thing. But I know um, like some people were toying with the idea of like a pick in place using um, like a Voron gantry as like the, uh, the framework of it. But I'm pretty sure most of the firmwares that pick in place machines use don't use um, Core XY motion. So they don't have the mechanics built in for it. That's what I'm worried about. Not so much that it can't do it. It's just the fact that it doesn't support it. <laughs> In. Get up on your bearing here. What I would recommend doing is when you run your belts, run your first belt through with extra, then take it out, well cut it, then take it out, and then cut another belt exactly the same length. That way you can match up tooth count and you can ensure both belts are the same. Because you want both belts to be the same length and tensioned equally, 
or as accurately to each other as possible. Um, and that is to prevent racking as well. So there's two types of racking with a Core XY. There's racking, there's, eh, they're both mechanical, but I'll put it this way. There, there's racking induced by the mechanics of the how you built your gantry, and there's racking from the belt tension itself. Um, one can sort of make up for the other, but they should be their own thing. So you should have it mechanically unracked before you belt it, and then after you belt it, you use the belt tension to adjust any racking induced by the belts themselves. So if your belts are both the same length, um, when you start, it just makes it a little bit easier to tune everything. So right now I have the belts in and I'm gonna snug them up a bit. So we'll get this one the same length, tighten that down. And tighten this one a bit. Get everything to move. Tighten it down just a bit. And now, once your belts are sort of snugged up, you're going to want to go through and make sure all the belts are actually riding on your idlers um, correctly. Because if they're riding on the edge of an idler, it'll damage the belts really quickly. So you want to just take a look at everything. Make sure your belts are riding on the idlers especially the ones at the back. There we go. And then also take this point to make sure they are riding on your 20 teeth for your drive motors um, accurately as well. Because if they're uh, out there, um, it's, it's belt rub. You don't, you don't want belt rub, obviously. So let's see here. We are good there. And then also, um, yeah, you're going to want to uh, get a ruler at this point. And uh, you're going to want to make sure that your gantry, you, you don't have to, you know, you're not tramming it here, but you want to make sure everything's somewhat equal before you check your belts for um, any misalignment issues. And the reason for that is if your gantry is skewed, your belts won't be running straight. So just quickly go around and just kind of eyeball your gantry, you know, pick a, a common number. So in this case, like 15 centimeters from the top and just make sure it's all kind of within that. There you go. And then just go around and make sure your belts, everything seems to be lined up. Your drive gears aren't rubbing. Yeah, that looks good there. Yep. There we go. Uh, what are the improvements for from the previous release? So in this case, going from a 2.2 to a 2.4, you probably won't see too much of a print quality, if any print quality difference. Um, your gantry should run a bit smoother because there is less motion components in the gantry. We took out the belt loops. Uh, we took out all the um, bearings on rod or gears on rods, on bearings. So we, we simplified the mechanicals of the printer. So the gantry should run smoother. Um, so it might be a little bit quieter. That's what I've noticed on mine. Um, less random noises that I hear. Um, really 2.4 is based on simplifying the build going forward. So we took everything we've learned from V2 to 2.1 to 2.2, and we basically started from scratch so we threw all the cat out, started over. Now I didn't design it, this is mostly all RCF. Um, but basically threw everything out, started it over and rebuilt the printer knowing everything we've learned along the way, as well as trying to simplify the build and simplify the bill of materials. So we've cut out 
some miscellaneous size screws. Uh, if we trim down the number of bearings you need, trim down the number of fasteners you need, basically try to start from scratch building a better design for on um, right from the top instead of basing it on a previous revision. So, so in terms of like, if, if you already have a fully functional 2.2 and you have no issues with it at all, should you jump to a 2.4? I, I wouldn't be, I would on my next maintenance phase, you know, if, if, if you're running your machine constantly um, and, you know, after every couple thousand hours you take it apart for maintenance, at that point I would, but I, I wouldn't go out of my way to completely strip it down. Um, for no reason, unless I was having issues. So if you're not having issues, I really wouldn't work. Um, but if you are building from scratch, jump right to 2.4. Okay, so um, these belts were on a 2.2 and I did trim them a little bit long, but this is the extra belt. Uh, you can't really see, but so if you are reusing your belts from 2.2 to 2.4 on the gantry, you can reuse your belts because the belt path is actually shorter on the gantry for 2.4. It's different on the Z. On the Z, it's longer. So unless you left extra, um, if you cut them flush on your 2.2, you will need new belts for your 2.4 Z. But if you cut them flush on your 2.2 gantry for your AB belts or your XY belts, you will be good for 2.4 because the belt path is shorter on the gantry on 2.4. Okay, so let's see here. Yeah, that's why. It keeps moving on me. All the weights in the back. And the belts aren't tension. Okay, so. Now, of course, once you have your belts on, you probably will notice some a uh, little bit more resistance to moving because you now have motors and belts and you're pushing against there's all the extra friction um, so when you're checking your gantry for racking you want to do that before you put the belts on you want to make sure everything moves smoothly before you belt it up because after you belt it up you're going to have more variables in play and you might not notice an issue you may have had so that is belting now one trick to know, and I can't remember who mentioned this, but one way to tell if your belting is even on both sides, yeah, see in this case I have racking issues, which I didn't have before. So obviously one of these belts is tighter than the other. So the first thing you're gonna do is you gotta make sure there's no tension in your uh, belt tensioners on your front idlers. You want them to be neutral. You want them to not push, be pulling on the belts at all. You want neutral tension. Let's take a look here. And then you're gonna tighten your belts so that they're equal. I can't remember who told me this, but one way that easily tell if you have issues with your uh, belting is when you move your gantry or your X gantry back and forth, and this is just pushing on the gantry, don't touch the tool head. If you're pushing it back and forth and the tool head is moving, you have unequal tension on your belts. So when you're pushing it back and forth, it shouldn't move. And then when you get to the front, you can also check for racking. So what you're going to do is basically manually go through hand tightening your belts. Now you're not going to be completely reefing on them, but you're going to hand tighten them. And then once you get it pretty much as good as you can get as close as you can, then you're going to tighten your belts with your front tensioners to remove any 
minor racking that still may be there and tighten up your belts. So, And you'll be able to see. Okay. So there we go. That feels good. What electronics will you use? Duet again. So this guy is using a duet. Um, this guy's going to use a taco. So. It's gonna use this guy. Taco Raven. That was the custom designed PCB uh, controller board specifically for Vorons we came up with, I think over a year ago. So right now I'm just trimming off the extra extra belt I have. So yeah, this guy's gonna run a clipper with a Raspberry Pi with the Taco Raven. Um, it's got 2130s, which aren't the greatest. Um, so if it does have issues, I'm fully prepared to swap out the Taco for dual SKRs. So yeah. That one's wrong screw. Okay, so we have everything belted up. Movement is good. Now, again, you are gonna have some friction. Um, it won't be definitely anywhere near as smooth when you originally checked it before you had the belts on, but we have belts on now, so. Okay, so now we're gonna put everything back together. Now, your belts. Um, you don't want to cut these belts super short. You do want to leave a little bit of extra and just kind of jam them in this hole here. Um, that's what that hole is for, is to hold the belts. You never want to cut your belts all the way short. You do want to leave a little bit, and that just makes it easier if you ever have to unbelt it and rebelt it. You actually have a little bit to hold on to it'll uh it'll help you uh is taco raven 12 volt only so if i'm not mistaken you can run up to 36 volts on this thing you can actually feed 36 volts directly to the motors if you feel like and then 24 volts to everything else and there is a selector here yep for the fans 
So you could run VIN, so whatever voltage you're feeding into the board will feed to the fan. So if you're feeding 24 volts, you'll feed 24 volts of fan. You can jump it to 12 volts because it has a 12 volt regulator on it. So you can run 12 volt fans with a 24 volt power supply. And you can also run five volt fans with a 24 volt power supply, just depending on what the jumper you put on. You also have replaceable fuses. Um, you have, what is it, uh, three heaters selectable. So you have a chamber, two heaters, you have a bed heater. Um, got the 2208s, uh, panel do hookup, um, 2IC hookup, you have your standard ramp style hookup. Um, what else did we do on this? We did a bunch of random stuff on here. And then we of course had to fix a bunch of stuff because a, we, there was issues with the design so we ended up uh, having to, I had to resolder a bunch of these little itty bitty diodes and replace them to get uh, the correct voltage for the 2130s. And then there's wires on here. It's definitely a first rev part of product. Um, SKR 1.4 or E3 Mini. Um, so the E3 Mini uh, 1.2 does have some issues. Um, we really don't like them, but they work fine on the V0. Um, the thermistor, because of the way Clipper talks to it for uh, temperature readings, uh, the thermistor readings are really weird unless you solder um, one of the diodes and bridge it. Um, but I, for a, a V1 or a V2, I'd go with a, a full-size SKR, uh, probably the 1.4, because the 1.3s are hard to find now. Um, we, we know the 1.3s work, that's why we recommended them for so long, but the 1.4s are fine. Um, so we'll go with the 1.4 if you're going with the new build. Um, I, I wouldn't specifically go with like an SKR Mini for like dual SKR Mini E3s. Um, I, I would go with just the standard SKR 1.4. Okay, so I'm going to put everything together now. So we're going to put our little uh, heater assembly on, screw it in. And you can do this at any point once you have your uh, heater attached to the X carriage, but you are going to grab something flat, like a ruler and you're going to go underneath and you're going to make sure that your nozzle sticks out further than your probe because uh, trust me it's not fun when it doesn't so you're going to check that there there we go and if you need to you can reach um, at least with the, the mosquito you can actually reach in and adjust the screws to drop and raise your probe if you need to and we're going to put our fan assembly back on And again, you don't want the wires pinching. put more heat sets in. So we gotta attach the uh, rear bracket for mounting our chain to the back. So, let's take a look here. mounts like that. There we go. And of course. 
course I can't get my set screws or my heat sets. There we go. God, I can't wait till I get a better camera. So, in case anyone's uh, curious, the current plan right now is um, to get an actual proper camera for the main cam. And then I'm going to replace this shitty little guy with the uh, the C920 that I'm currently using as my wide angle lens, or my wide angle view camera. So, if all goes well, my PCI Express USB 3.0 card should be in this week, along with the capture card. And then the, uh, I gotta run to Costco and pick up a camera. So. So that is the current plan. So hopefully I can fix this audio issue and then next week we have some good audio and visuals while you guys watch me fiddle with wires. There we go. Okay, let me just check and see if anyone is trying to get a hold of me on the Discord. If anyone's trying to get a hold of me on the Discord, uh, ask in chat on YouTube so I can see. There we go. Okay, so now, get this back out of the way. We have to attach the uh, drag chain mount to the back. So. Try not to knock everything over while I do this. So the way this attaches is you actually have to take some screws out of your motor. So you're actually going to be removing the screws for um, these two screws on your NEMA 17 for your extruder. Now you're not opening it up so it won't damage anything and you are replacing them with other screws um, but this basically mounts right like that and then you have your wire cover connector part so that fills the void and then this mounts over top and then if you look there's a notch on the bottom let's see there Yep, you can see the notch, and then you have a screw hole in the front, which is a heat set screw on the front. So that way, to open this up now, instead of having the fancy doors that we used to have, you undo the, you loosen the bottom screw, and you undo the side screw, and the whole thing pivots up. So I'll show you here in a moment once I remove this. Uh, assuming cameras aren't sold out in your area, I'm hoping, um, Costco has that, um, Canon HF R800 that everyone recommends um, in stock. So I'm going to grab that. And then the capture card is a, um, it's basically the Aver Media equivalent of the Cam Link. I'm going to be grabbing, that's why I have to grab the uh, USB 3.0 PCI Express expansion card because, uh, oh shit. You really want to, don't want to strip these. So. But that was the only thing in stock. It, it, it is it is scary how many things are out of stock right now. And I think it's a mixture of everyone buying up everything, and then also nothing getting resupplied from China. So when you unscrew, when you unscrew the screws um, for your uh, your NEMA 17 here, they are very tight. The screws are tight. You do want to use um, a good Phillips head screwdriver. Because um, you don't want to strip them, and uh, 
they're not the greatest steel. So, just put that there for now. So that goes like that, and that goes like that. So for screws, let's see what we need. Because again, blind hole, you want to make sure you're using the right screw. So yeah, I know a few of you have donated to the stream, but if anyone's curious, if anyone does donate, it goes directly to uh, paying for stuff for streaming. Um, I do these videos because I like doing them, and uh, I'm kind of ashamed of the quality of the first one and the first couple, so I am putting some money into this because, you know, it's fun, and we're all stuck at home anyways. We need something to do. So the first few donations actually covered the capture, well, a portion of the capture card. So if anyone was curious where all that was going. There we go. So that goes like that. Yeah, Kit, um, I, I kind of like the side panel thing here. Uh, the only downside to it, and I will admit this is a downside, is it does not have as much room. So compared to the doors, where you can literally just stuff everything in there and just close them, um, you, you really don't have as much room as you used to. So as you can see, um, it does pivot. So what you do is you just kind of loosen both screws. You don't need to undo them. I know in the original revision you had to undo both screws to get this off, but you just loosen both screws and uh, the whole thing pivots up. So you can actually get at everything and then when you're done, just kind of pivot it back down and then tighten it back up. And then you also have like a really short one in the front here just to Hold it clamped to the side. Or an M8 or something. And then all the scalpers buying that's left. Oh yeah, um, I'm up in Canada here. I actually pulled up my Amazon receipt. I bought the C920 that you're seeing right now um, last July. And I paid, including shipping and taxes and everything, I paid $56 for it. And that's Canadian, by the way. Um, right now on Amazon Canada, a Logitech C920 is $250 plus like $30 shipping. So um, it actually makes more sense to just say screw it and buy a proper camera and just bite the bullet and. Uh, pay for the uh, capture card because paying 250 for this quality is not worth it okay so that is how you assemble your afterburner so that's fully assembled there now I'm not going to get into wiring tonight um, but I am going to start uh, probably start putting this stuff on so so I'm going to need this for next week. So these were chains that I bought for, uh, these are just the Chinese, the China Special chains. These aren't the Igus. But um, when you buy the chains, um, I bought two meters of them, so two one meter pieces. And that's plenty for two Vorons. 
So what I did was I actually printed, and you can find them on the GitHub, uh, new end pieces. So you can just print new end pieces, and that'll allow you to uh, reuse them. Voila. Now for these, because it is wires, and to save as much space as you can, I actually I do use button heads. Um, To minimize any potential wearing of the wires on anything, especially anything metal, um, I do use button head screws to hold my uh, my dry chains down. Well, thanks, Nero Q and uh, Nizlog, Nizlog. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, anything donated, it's not going into my pocket. It's not even touching my pocket because there's already a hole in my pocket from buying stuff for streaming. So I do greatly appreciate anything that is donated, um, and you guys are awesome. Um, and I, I'm gonna, I'm hoping to keep doing this for as long as I can. Um, I know that the Saturday night doesn't work for some people, but unfortunately, I work steady afternoons. Um, so Saturday night is like only my only free night that I could do this. I don't think you guys want to watch me at 2 in the morning after I work uh, a 10 hour shift um, but after I get V2 up here I do have some other projects I have working on that I'll probably keep streaming um, I got to rewire the hot end on V0 um, I got to uh, finish the little spare parts I3 sitting over there um, and um, I'll tease something called manifold so, depending on the state of that, who knows. But yeah, I've got plenty of projects. Because the problem is, this would be done in a weekend. Because when I redid this guy, I, I came downstairs and I just locked myself in the basement and completely rebuilt it as a 2.4 in a weekend. When you're only working three hours a week while you're streaming, um, it does kind of slow down the build a little bit but it's worth it because I, I know this is helping a lot of people finish their builds um, so I have no problems taking my time to show people how to do it and thank you for following along so for the chains um, depending on the chains there's really two ways you can do it you can run chain to uh, let's see right about it's a little over the halfway point. So you run chain to basically a little over the halfway point. You you turn it, you lock it down, and then you run like uh, you sleeve it for the rest of the way. Um, because I have enough chain, I am legit just going to run chain the whole way um, because I I can. So I am just going to run chain all the way to like here, and then end it here, and then go right into the bridge. So. Off. It's it's a matter of personal preference and taste. Um, let's see here. So, pop that off. Come on. Alexander with five dollars. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Um, aren't chains just aesthetic in this context? You know what? I've had arguments with people. I love the look of a 3D printed object. Some people are chasing that. You no, know, oh, you can't see the layer lines, but like, oh, where where do I got it? One second. This. this is a Groot I printed with a 0.8 millimeter nozzle 
and 0.4 layer height. Now, it's hard to see because of the shitty webcam quality, but I, I have a video of it on my channel. But you can see the layer lines on this guy, and they're thick. And you know what? I, I like that look. Some people like will chase forever trying to remove all hints that it's, a, it's an FDM product, which I understand. I understand. You know, sometimes it really depends on the print, but there's nothing wrong with seeing layer lines like... Uh, this guy looked much better uh, before my son dropped it um, and broke it, but this guy is all ABS. Now, he originally had a three-foot wingspan. Um, as you can see, he's been uh, he's stunted, but this is ABS, and you really have to look to see the layer lines in this guy. But, yeah. So, it, it really depends on the model and what you're going after, but I, I, I like layer lines in some things. Don't let your kids play with your Alduin dragons. Okay, so to attach the end, um, you literally just need uh, an M3 peanut and screw it down. Edwin, $9.99. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Glad you're enjoying the stream. And thank you for joining me on a Saturday night. I don't have any tea tonight, though. I forgot. So, delicious water. Yeah, I printed that guy on a 2.1, I believe. If you go digging on the Discord, um, I'm pretty sure I do have pictures of it um, from a while ago. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much the game files from Alduin from uh, Skyrim. So the, the crappy thing is, it, it doesn't stand. It, it constantly tips over. So I was going to print a base for it, but that would entitle me learning how to design a base. So um, it ended up just sitting on a shelf until one day my son, who's two now, um, got his little hands on it. And uh, needless to say, um, Alduin is no more. No, well, he ain't flying no more. Okay. So there we go. So that is our X drag chain installed. And now we need our bridge. So we need to install this guy. So at this point, I'm going to have to take these two screws out because I had two screws in there. And uh, I have a tendency of putting these screws in first and leaving them in longer than they need to be because I don't like breaking this. This is more robust than the previous revisions of it, but um, at one point they were kind of fragile. I'm gonna put my Allen key, there we go. Nathan, $4.99, thank you man, appreciate it. I'm just hoping that I can get to the point where you guys can actually see me and see what I'm working on with decent quality. And what I would really like now is to see where I drop this Allen key. Ah, there we go. Uh, nope. screws need to be. Don't tell me. I might not have button heads. Of course, of course. Yes, 16 mil. Okay. button head 16 mil. I got tons of socket heads, but running low on the buttons. There we go. Okay. Now I'll install, I'll cover electronics next week. Um, I'm not going to get into that this week because it's uh, 
1030 already. So I'm just going to wrap up the mechanicals a bit. So now we got to put more heat set inserts in because I always forget to put them in. You know, I always say put them in before you do anything. And for the heat sets, um, I know you can buy them from a bunch of different places. Just get the 100 count bag um, and never have to worry about them again. Because the 100 count I've done two Vorons with. Um, and I still have some extras, and then I still have this whole bag of long ones that we don't use anymore. So just buy the 100 count bag and be done with it. And then you don't have to worry about running low or dropping one and having to hunt it down because you need it. How is the music level, by the way? Like, um, or actually, no, I have the music off. Or can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear the music. Um, is the music level too loud, too quiet? How is it? Uh, if I see the tooth, I learned, look at the carriage itself, Nerq. Um, so as you're moving the carriage back and forth, like just grab, like hold on to the bottom of like the rail, for example, near the middle, um, but don't touch the X carriage or don't touch the belt and just push the gantry back and forth. And if you see the, the uh, X carriage, do this and move back and forth. Now, if it, it moves ever so slightly, I wouldn't be too concerned because um, the motors will overpower that easily. But if it's like jumping back and forth quite a bit, um, odds are you have uneven belt tension. If it's just moving ever so slightly, it could just be a slightly wonky bearing. Background music volume is fine. Okay, that's good. I, know, I just felt like I needed something in the background of these streams. I know we still have that audio issue and I'm hoping to have that fixed by next week. Cool dude, 299. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Okay, more belt or more chain. So uh, there we go. And again, I know there's not a lot of uh, accent pieces on the 2.4 compared to previous revisions, but you can print the end pieces for your dry chain and have more accent pieces. I'm running out of button head screws now. Jeez. Fasteners and 100 count bags off. Yeah, honestly, for fasteners, um, just get one of these big acro bin um, cabinet things and just fill it up. Because once you start with 3D printing, you'll start like fiddling with other hobbies. Like right now I'm looking at, I, I built that little stream deck that I'm using um, for my fancy camera changes. Um, I love this thing by the way, um, cause it, it costs like all in like 20 bucks and you could do it for under 10 if you order it all off AliExpress. And it does pretty much everything a stream deck mini does for a fifth of the price. Cause those things are like 130 up here. But like right now I'm looking at, you know, um, if you go on Thingiverse, you can find it. it's called the Sick 30, 6, 6, 68. I think it's a printed keyboard. 
It's a little 10 keyless keyboard. So I'm looking at that now. So once you get involved in 3D printing, you'll see all these little projects, especially if you get into electronics and you get all these little ideas of stuff you want to do now. And just having a massive amount of screws makes it so much nicer to not have to hunt everything down and, you know, wait on screws. And you can just print it and slap it together in a night. It's great. Okay, so we're going to end this chain right about there. Yes, John, um, I do have it like specifically tuned down. I, I know I don't want it too loud. I just wanted something to fill the dead space. Like even in my headphones, I have it turned down. Plus I think it kind of drowns out any little background noise you hear of my printer running. Not that there's much. But yeah, GK, um, I'm kind of lucky because I work in a tool shop. So we have a Fastenal rep who comes in pretty much every day. And I just have to go ask him for stuff. And uh, he has no problem, you know. I pay market price for it. He leaves a bag of screws on my toolbox. And when I come into work, they're there. So I, I do love that. The problem is with uh, it being Rona season right now, he's not allowed in our shop. So I don't have access to my uh, easily available screws and other uh, fasteners. So I'm, I'm kind of running on empty here. So I still have some, but supplies drying up. Okay, so when you put your drag chains on, you always want to, when you screw them into final position. You want everything at the max position just to ensure that nothing uh, binding up and everything has enough uh, play and whatnot. There we go. Maniform. Oh God. Yeah, one of these guys. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I I like my normal keyboard. Considering I don't my. If you ever saw my typing, it's horrible because I I type with like these two fingers, sometimes the middle finger and the thumb. I I, I peck type real quick because I never took a. I taught myself how to type back in the day playing like StarCraft on the computer. Um, because I, I don't think we ever had like a typing class in uh, school back then. And uh, so I, I type weird. So those that keyboard would be completely wasted on me. Like I, I'm sure it's super efficient for those that can type like that, but I cannot type like that. So yeah. Um, is nylon sleeve better than chain? So if you're referring to the, uh, the original two point uh, one style where we had the tape chain, where we had like a, um, like the nylon sleeving. Like this stuff, um, where we had this in like a tape measure. Um, this stuff is easier to put together, I find. Well, compared to the zip chains, drag chains are better. Um, the problem with the nylon, um, the, the tape chain, was that we had issues with friction. Once you hit about a thousand hours, it would actually start wearing away the outer casing of the wires and uh, causing shorts and your your end stops would start wor stop working, fans would be intermittent, uh, you get runaways and all kinds of funky shit. So we don't recommend using tape chain anymore. Um, 
You can use the printed chains, but honestly, for the 10 bucks it costs to get the Chinese drag chains, um, even if you don't want to spring for the Masumi, I, I've had zero issues with the China chains. So I would just go with China chains. Um, if you're ordering so much from AliExpress, you might as well pay an extra 15, 20 bucks at most and get some uh, actual chains. So no chains like Ultimaker. Are you referring to having a um, an umbilical? Like where it just kind of, you have a mass of wires come up to the hot end. Is that what you're referring to, uh, woke gentleman there? Okay, so technically with the afterburner, you don't even need a boat in. You can just run filament directly into it. But the problem with running, having an umbilical, especially with the V2. Now with the V1, it's not a huge issue because on the V1, um, the gantry doesn't move. Now on the V2, the gantry moves. So one second, let me find my... Uh, This is the, um, from, was it 2.1? This is V2, actually. This is my wiring harness from V2, okay? So these were your hot end wires, and this was your XY joint, or your motors. Um, XY joint was these. So this is Cat5. We don't use Cat5, for the love of God, don't use Cat5. So the problem is, up here it's not bad, but the problem is your print starts down here. So you're printing down here, you're printing down here, you're printing, you're printing, and as the gantry moves up, your chains, your your wire is hanging down. And now it's in your print volume and it's catching on stuff, especially when you're way up here. So you can't really run an umbilical cord unless you have some sort of mechanism to pull it up with it. Um, otherwise it's gonna fall into your print volume and it's gonna cause issues like failed prints and crashes. So the drag chains, are there because we have the flying gantry we need to basically keep the cable management in check no matter where the tool head is in the print volume so while you you know the original spec of a v1 up to v1 point or even v1.6 had an umbilical cord um, even on v1.8 now the umbilical has gone because we've enclosed it so yeah, so some people have tw played with it. I I've seen a few pictures of somebody um, who did all the electronics up top instead of underneath, and they used uh, an umbilical cord, but just looking at it, they had like um, one of those little like uh, belt clip things for ratcheting to pull it back up. It, it just doesn't look clean in my opinion too. Like it, it looks so much cleaner with uh, no, no CNC machines run with an umbilical cord that are like industrial grade, right? It, it looks clean like this, so. Okay, I think the last one I can put on is my drag chain for Zed. Yeah, so uh, Kit, in regards to Ultimaker and the V1, the V1 was basically originally designed as a DIY, um, a, a DIY Ultimaker killer basically. It was designed to have a larger print volume to printer size or a smaller print, or was it? Basically, a more space efficient Ultimaker that was faster and cheaper and DIY. That's where, how the V1 originally came about, by the way. So that goes in there. So I gotta put some nuts in here. So I got a feeling this part's gonna be annoying. So what I am going to do is actually just take this uh, apart right now. <laughs> so I don't have to work with this giant piece. I can take it 
taken apart. Much more rigid. I don't think these are the official, like the, the recommended um, Z chains. I, I think I bought these from a different supplier, so I have no idea how uh, good these guys are going to work. Um, so we're just going to wing it. So I'm pretty sure these are actually too thick. Uh, let's find out. Oh, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. So let's see here. Oh yeah, that's going to be annoying as hell. Super glue time. Yep, I'm going to have to super glue these guys together. Prevent them from going on adventures. Yep, definitely super glue time. Uh, reverse Bowden, if you're referring to running a Bowden down to the extruder just to feed the filament to it, um, I do that on this guy right here. Um, grab some three millimeter ID Bowden tube and use that. Um, it's just to keep it from getting tangled. Um, another reason is with the speeds you're hitting, you do actually risk um, snapping your filament. So if you're printing with, you know, um, Say you're printing, you know, right at the back of your printer for a while, and then it quickly rips to go 300 millimeters a second to the front of your printer. Um, it could tug the filament so hard it actually breaks it, and you probably don't want that. So with having a feeder Bowden, it kind of prevents that from happening um, because it has to have a certain amount of filament already always in the tube, basically. So I, I, I would run a Bowden to the afterburner. There's no fitting on the top, it's just a friction fit. It just sits in there, um, but it, it works just fine. So that's what I would do. Um, and that's what I am doing. Now on this guy, I might not do that um, just because of how tall it is. Um, I don't know if I'll run into any issues of the Bowden hanging down into the print volume if I'm at the height. Um, it, that's something I'm gonna have to look into, uh, but that's why we test stuff. So let me get my super glue here, put a little drop here to hold these into position. I really wish I can get you a better view, but I'm just basically dropping some super glue in to hold these uh, hex nuts in to the uh, holder so they don't go flying on me. And now we wait for super glue to dry. So much fun. So yeah, so current progress, um, wiring should be done next week. Um, I might start hooking stuff up, um, but I am hoping in the next couple weeks this should be up and running. Um, I am waiting on my energetic bed 
to come in. So I might be printing on some uh, painter's tape for a bit. We'll see. Um, but until then, um, it, it should be moving either next, probably not next weekend, um, but the weekend after. So if I get it all wired up, um, which I'm gonna have to be, I might be filming on the floor for that week because um, this is upside down. The electronics are up here. This ain't gonna work. So I'm gonna have to figure out something for filming um, the electronics. I'm probably literally gonna just sit it on the floor and have the camera facing right down on it. Um, that's probably what I'm gonna do for electronics day. Um, but running the wires won't be too hard. I already have the loom made up. I'm reusing the loom, so it's too, it's uh, silicone, um, not PTFE like the fancy stuff. Um, but I'm going to use that because it's already made. And uh, if it only works a thousand hours, I'll deal with it in a thousand hours. So. And then once I get this C in, um, I'm probably going to call it a night after that. Because it is starting to get a little bit late. dries so quick when you get it on your hands but uh otherwise it takes forever come on the end link of the chain uh on these chains this is um this is store-bought the only ones that are different are the uh, 15 mil chain that i have on or the the xy chain i mean that stuff is uh i printed end links these ones is how it came but I don't think these were the spec ones so I don't have full confidence in them working but we'll see it should work it's just gonna be a little finicky I got a feeling oh, of course I glued, glued it to my hand screwed to my hand or glued to my hand now awesome ah yep okay let's see here Yeah, the, I know there is that stuff you can get, but I, I don't use super glue enough to get the uh, activator. There we Okay, so. 
know you guys are getting a great view of all this work. Yes, Kent. Um, they're a pain because of the uh, the fiberglass insulation they use. So the the thermistors and the uh, the hot end wires are usually a complete pain to crimp. Um, but usually, once you know, you only got to do it once, and they're the ones that are the biggest pain. That's why I'm using these uh, the Fisec. Uh, yeah, I think it's actually so Fisec is how you pronounce it. I think. Um, they come pre-crimped and they're pretty short, so I'm going to give those a shot. So where do I put the chains? So put this back together. These ones are kind of a pain because they don't have a little feed lip for getting them started. Just kind of have to brute force them together. There we go. Okay, so uh, gotta lift this up. Again, you want to make sure you got enough length at max travel. Now, I never run my printer all the way up. I always leave like a good 20 millimeter buffer zone just in case. Um, but good to know where everything sits if you have to. So I believe this is the end piece. be able to come straight up it looks like because oddball size printer remember this doesn't line up um, this doesn't sit on this side and it doesn't sit on that side so maybe it sits on this side let's see yeah it doesn't want to sit there so I'm gonna have my D chain run on a bit of an angle, it looks like. And that's going to go right there. And come down right like that. Okay. So, I need to take off two chains, two legs. So, this guy right there. Yeah, the fiberglass is uh, super annoying, trust me. I, I've crimped so many heaters over the past two years, it's it's ridiculous. Okay, so that goes there. That goes there. And this is not gonna work. So I need to add one more. Just we being Andre.
goes like that now. And there we go. And that'll go right like that, down into the bottom. So, same thing, gotta put this together. Uh, the PT100, um, I bought a thermistor with a PT100. Would that need anything special? Yes, the PT100 does need a, uh, I think it's called an amplification board, um, because the PT100 doesn't have enough, uh, you need an amp for it, essentially. It, it doesn't have enough power by itself to be read correctly. So you need a, a, an amplification board, which they do exist. There are ones you can buy, and uh, depending on what controller board you are using, um, if you Google your board plus PT100, it should come up with a guide or instructions on how to use it. So it's not super difficult. You just need an additional item. Uh, Kyle Davis, the PT100, it's basically, um, a, a, it's like a thermistor, but it's more accurate. So if, if you're printing like super high temp stuff, you, you want a PT100 because it's more accurate than a standard like beta 3900K thermistor that we use. But if you're just printing, you know, ABS, you're perfectly fine. Emerson with R50. Um, I don't know how much that is, but thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for watching our streams. Thank you for enjoying it. And thank you for donating. That's going to be annoying because this is inside chain. Inside chain is kind of a pain for unsnapping everything. And that is floppy because it's not riding straight. One thing you can do if you're using like drag chain, for example, is when you run it up and down, you'll find like a, a good portion of it doesn't need to bend. Um, why does that bend? That doesn't need to bend. I might have it backwards. I might have installed this one backwards. Anyways. Um, it doesn't need to bend. So what you can do is um, glue them together for like the bottom five, 10, however many it is that don't need to bend. That way it prevents them from flopping over. Now you do have that piece that you can put there too to prevent it from uh, bending. Yeah, I just realized I have it. Actually, I don't know if I have it backwards. Let's see here. Because again, this isn't the recommended stuff. This is just when we were toying with the idea. Oh yeah, yeah, I do have it backwards. Okay, I gotta take this all. Um, be fine with wires in it. Yeah, 
Um, at what percentage do I get? I'm not 100% sure yet. Um, because with YouTube, it takes like two months from the time you qualify for getting paid, like making that YouTube cash before you actually see any of it. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming they take a cut. Um, I, you, I, I don't know. Um, I think it's like 10 or 15% they take. Um, I don't know where it goes. I don't know what they do with it. Um, but they, I, I'm pretty sure they, they do take a cut. Um, but yeah, YouTube has like all these requirements you have to meet before you can actually like make money on YouTube. Even just having supers, like to turn supers on, you need like a thousand subs minimum or something like that. You can't just, you know, turn it on and make money. Which I'm not doing this to make money. If I was doing this to make money, I would have waited until I had money before I bought stuff to do this. <laughs> Because right now I, I'm spending money before I made the money. So, definitely not doing this for the cash. Okay, so. I'm pretty sure this is uh, Andre. I'm pretty sure this is the uh, belt you recommended me to get at some point, probably. Thirty percent. Okay, they take thirty percent. And then I'm assuming I got to pay tax on it at some point, too. cross that bridge when it can come to it. I just did my taxes, so. Tax man got all my money. There we go. Okay, that, this makes more sense now. There we go. Okay. This makes a lot more sense. I am not setting up a Patreon. I am nowhere near um, doing, I, if I've been doing this for like two years, then maybe, but I, I'm way too early into this to guarantee content on a monthly basis for your money. Um, and Patreon takes a, a cut anyways, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I, I am not setting up a Patreon. I am nowhere near that point yet. Appreciate it, though.
Yeah, you, you want a good Patreon? Um, Bad Obsession Motorsports. Go watch Project Pinky. Give them money. That's a Patreon worth supporting. There we go. Okay. There we go. That looks much better. So, now we have to put the rear block in, and now this, um, all this one does, do I have it printed? Yes. Yes. Um, this one just rides on the back extrusion, and it allows you to, well it doesn't allow you to, but it, it keeps your, your Z chain from keeling over. So this basically just installs. It sits like that, and it just keeps it from bowing out. It just, it's for aesthetics, really, more than anything. I don't think it'll ever actually kink, but uh, that's what it's for. Highlight reel trimmed eight hours. <laughs> this probably would have been a lot shorter if I actually had a manual and was uh, didn't have to redo everything. Plus, stopping to answer questions does eat up quite a bit of time. Nothing wrong with it. It just that does actually add quite a bit of time to uh, the build. As for highlights, um, I am trying to take the portions of the build that I think most people have the trouble with and make individual videos for it. So um, if you do go to like my YouTube channel, um, I, I do have videos on how to assemble some of the major components um, that people do seem to have trouble with. Um, so let's see here. So yeah, so if you go to like my YouTube channel, um, I do have a video here like how to assemble the AB motor mounts and the front idlers, um, a video on how to put together the, the Z motor module and the, the upper Z idlers. Um, I don't know if I'll do one to put together the afterburner simply for the fact I don't have spare parts for the afterburner. I don't have a spare uh, BMG extruder. Um, so I would have to rip this back apart and then put it back together for a video. I, honestly probably will end up doing that at some point um, but the next video I'll probably do is I'll probably take the belts out and do a video on racking on how to fix racking so that's probably what will be the next standalone video 
And then there's the streams, of course, which if you have any questions on the bill, just ask them during the stream. It doesn't even have to be about the part I'm specifically working on. Um, so yeah, so I think that's about as far as we're going to go tonight. Um, yeah, I really don't like that part, but you can always glue that into position. So let me just make sure you're good at max height. This is really annoying. It's easy to drop it manually, but to raise it is super annoying. And by the way, don't ever do this. Um, I'll try to avoid moving your motors as much as possible um, when they're actually hooked up to a board because a motor running manually is a generator and you will put back current into your board, which depending on how often you do it, the board and the quality, you can damage your board potentially. So you really don't want to do that. Okay, so this is like super max height. I will never print this high, but that seems to be good there. So we are good there. So let's see how much height we actually got. So let me dig out my bed. Using the bed from when this was a V1. So while this is 330 by 330, this is a 12 inch bed. Um, I may get a bigger bed down the line, but this is aluminum. Yeah, it's a quarter inch, but it'll still work. It's already got the heater on it. Um, I'm not going to throw it in the garbage, so I'm just going to reuse it. Um, if it has issues, then I'll get a, a different bed, but for now, I'm just going to reuse the bed. So I believe the standoffs are what, a quarter inch, I think. So. Let's just throw some spacers in there for now and see how much height we actually get out of this guy. So we'll just throw some random spacers in. See what we actually get. Don't use bearings as spacers, the printer's kids. Not a good idea. So Tallboy actually officially gets Nozzle tip to bed. Three hundred and ninety millimeters is that. Now I probably could get an even four hundred if I slam it right up to the top, but you really never do that. So three ninety, I could probably push it to three seventy five safely and never worry about it. So yeah. So as always, um, that's it for the build tonight. Um, while I'm cleaning up, if anyone has any questions, it's an open floor, ask away. And I really gotta finish this guy one night.
Spacers, Ivan, Miranda. I should know that reference, but I cannot remember it right now. Is it an Expanse thing or a BSG thing? That sounds very familiar. And I, I should know that reference. Miranda. Oh, Firefly. Serenity. Now I remember it. Right? I'm right. I think I'm right. Okay, so put Tall Boy away. there. Gotta get my picture for the subreddit. A half inch plate. Um, that is, it's not overkill. Well, it is overkill, but it, it doesn't move. So you don't really have to worry about really any of the major downsides that a heavy plate would have, other than the fact your printer is going to be heavy, um, and your heat up times is going to be longer, and your cool down time is going to be longer. But functionally, it'll it'll work just fine. Um, it's just heavy. Um, three point leveling. Don't get me started on three point leveling. Three point leveling works if you are dealing with two perfectly flat surfaces. Um, your bed is never perfectly flat, and this gantry will never be perfectly flat. Um, so plus, um, it's a square. Um, we would have to put one of these in the like middle, and then you're you have two corners that are kind of pivoting. Um, and a Warren V2 four point leveling makes sense because it's a square, not a triangle. Um, Firefly, um, Joss Whedon um, show. They also made a movie. Um, one of the plants is called Miranda in the movie, and they're in space. So that's where I thought that reference was from. Time to take some parts apart, throw them in the garbage. So yeah, so at 11.30, I'll shut the stream down. So in the meantime, I'm just taking apart the uh, parts that I printed and built specifically for the tutorial video and uh, salvage the screws and throw the parts in the garbage. Five twenty now and gets light outside already. Good night. What were you doing up this late? I hey, I appreciate you hanging out. Get some sleep, man. Good morning and good night. You probably should, yeah, honestly, it, it's only like, they only made like 12 episodes, and then they made the movie. Um, and of the 12 episodes, only like a couple of them really advanced the plot, the rest are just literally filler, because um, it's from that era of TV shows where a lot of them were just half filler. But it, it's a good show. It, it's definitely something you should watch, at least once. Um... Yeah, shit's whack, man. Okay, 
So this has a heat set insert in it. So if anyone's uh, curious about how uh, strong these are, now this is that uh, front tension bar. Those headphones are on their way. <clears throat> That's how much force it takes to rip it out. And that was ripping it out the direction it went in. So it went in this way and it came out that way. Most of the time we have it, you're trying to pull it through plastic. So uh, heat set inserts are strong. I don't even know where that screw went. So yeah, um, you don't need to worry about them. If you seat them properly and don't overheat them, they, uh, they are not going anywhere. keeps asking me if I'm still here. Yes, I am still here. Keep playing music. So I think I'm going to call it here. I hope all you guys have a great night. Everyone stay safe out there. Uh, stay indoors, wash your hands, wear a mask, yada yada. Have fun building your printers. If you do have any questions, um, a lot of this will be available, so you will be able to watch it. Um, I figured out the issue because somebody was asking me how come sometimes the chat is available and sometimes it's not. Um, if a video gets copyright strike for any reason, even if I use like music for two seconds, um, I can mute the music, but what happens is if the video gets um, edited in any way, um, I lose you lose the uh, chat stream with the VOD. So hopefully that won't get hit this time, so hopefully the chat will stay up. But if you do have any questions, um, ask them next stream, ask in the Discord, or just ask them in the chat below. Um, once it, the VOD is up. Uh, what's the price range for a kit like yours? So the Voron uh, V, any of the Vorons, uh, there are no official kits. Um, there is a sourcing guide and a bill of materials on the website, vorondesign.com. Um, if you go there, um, you can find the full um, price list, or well, not price list, but sourcing guide to where you can find all the components you need to build the printer, um, as, long, eh, as well as the bill of materials. Um, a V2, you are looking twelve to fifteen hundred dollars USD. Um, shipping and wherever you are in the world might uh, affect that. Um, the V1 is anywhere from eight hundred to a thousand, and the V0 is around four to six hundred. Again, depends on where you are in the world and shipping, and um, where you're sourcing your parts from. So. So anyways, I hope everyone has a great night, um, sleep well, and take care.